Anya, can you find Johnson on the attendee side and bring him over? I shall. Nice. I see. Um, Folks joining in. Not there. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. We can't see you, but we can see your names in the list. <laughs> Hopefully, everybody slept well. <laughs> Nice. Numbers keep going up. Looks good. Oh. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Sorry, we don't have any inspirational music playing this morning. That was uh, there was supposed to be inspirational music, but we don't have any. So we're just um, we just have a, a slow build up until we get started. I think you just threw me under the bus without throwing me under the bus. <laughs> I didn't say who was supposed to have inspirational music. I just said there there was supposed to be some inspirational background music playing. Um, small people trickled in. Instead, you get to stare at us for the next three minutes while we wait right. for more people to come and on. We could hum inspirational tunes as well. You first, David. Yeah, feel free to start. <laughs> Um, I see that Gary and Stacy are on, so they would appreciate if we played something like Trollolo, just <laughs> walking the song around. So maybe I'll just uh, quickly pull that up. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Johnson. Hey, Johnson. Good morning. Good morning, y'all. How's it going? Your internet's a little oh, bit wow. delayed. Ooh, I'm gonna fix it. One minute. Ooh, we have somebody from Puerto Rico. Wow. Thanks for joining in, guys. California. Yeah, it's early for our California friends. This is for um, Stacy and Gary. This is our inspirational music for this morning. Is that a Russian song, David? It is. Have you never heard of Trollolo? I've, I've obviously heard from, from you talking about it, but based on your fears of um, Russian spies, <laughs> interesting choice for today. It's my favorite song. It's a great song for walking to. This is my. Um, this is the, when I when I was recovering from my cast women's, This is. Uh, it's got a good pace for walking. It's got a nice beat, like, right, Malova? Yeah, it's a nice beat. It gets us going. I don't know that it would be my song of choice, um, but it's good. Oh, I love this. Gary is up and walking around now that he's heard the music. <laughs> Telling you, it does that to you. Good afternoon to the people in Germany. I'm so glad you guys are on. It's an international crowd. I love that we can have so many people from all over joining us. From Canada. My dad was born in Canada. Spain. Wow, this is great. What do you think, beloved? Do you think we should go ahead and get things uh, started in just a yeah. moment or two? What do you think? Yeah, let's uh, 10 or 5. Let's do it. We'll give a couple, people a couple more minutes. All right, yeah. it's 10 or 5, and that means that I do need to play an inspirational song then, not just troll. Uh... Oh, why? It's, seven, it's 4 a.m. Wow. Good morning. <laughs> Hi, Yankee. Good morning, everyone. Good 
all over Australia and the Netherlands. Netherlands, it's great. Great. Yeah. Carol, you are amazing joining at 4 a.m. I don't think I could have put myself out of bed at 4 a.m. for anything. <laughs> Which means she's in a two days in a row, too. I know. That's she amazing. Yesterday, too. Mm -hmm. That is strength. I could stay up till 4 a.m. I don't think I could get up at 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, it's either the day 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 4 a.m. I'm way gone. It's not very clear. It is. Oh, it's this music. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta get us inspired for the day. It's 10.05 in Australia. Jonathan, all time zones. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. shared that you'll be going to medical school in Australia, so you'll uh, soon be in, uh, in Ashley's time zone. Just a little bit. Yeah, I'll be going to the University of Queensland, so we'll be hopping over there. We'll jump on Summit at 10 p.m. Totally doable. <laughs> I'll be probably studying at that time, right? <laughs> of course. It's such exciting news. What do you think? We'll have a kick this thing off. Let's do it. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I thought yesterday was um, such a great start to the patient summit. This is the eighth year that we've done this and um, it's just been so amazing to get the chance to see everyone and to um, be a part of the small groups and, and hear the great questions that came up um, yesterday. We um, are really excited for day two of the patient summit. We've got a lot of great content planned for today um, and hopefully uh, any questions that you had from yesterday, um, you can uh, uh, bring up today and we can get a chance to discuss them. I know there's a lot of interest, particularly um, in the interaction between COVID and, and Castleman disease. Um, but before we dive into the agenda for today, Malev and I did just want to take a moment to um, recognize that here in, in the United States, September 11th is um, a day that has um, a lot of meaning here. It's a really sad day in our history here in the U.S. And of course, the last 20 years have been um, have, have, have uh, certainly uh, reflected um, a lot of the pain and sadness from the from uh, September 11th, 2001. So just wanted to acknowledge this day uh, in our history um, and uh, turn it over to Maleva in case she has anything else that she wants to add. Thanks, David. Yeah, I, I definitely think um, one thank you to all of you because I know that um, all of us lived through this. And I think that, you know, over the last 20 years, our world has completely changed. And, you know, for myself personally, we were directly impacted. My husband serves in the military and um, has deployed four times in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and um, went to Iraq and Afghanistan. He's actually deployed again right now um, in Saudi Arabia, not in support of something directly tied to 9-11, but just gone in general. So um, anybody who's had met family members that have served are serving who have, um, you know, unfortunately passed away um, while they're doing their service. Just thank you to all of you because um, it's definitely not something I thought I would live through in my own lifetime. So um, definitely happy that we're able to at least in some way remember everybody and just be here together today. Yeah, I agree, Malova. You know, something you and I have talked about before is um, trying to create silver linings in the midst of really tough times. So September 11th for me has a very uh, painful connotation thinking about September 11th of um, 2001, but getting together with all of you today and, um, and hopefully having a really special day today around the patient summit, around Castleman disease, coming up with um, a plan for the future, hopefully we can create a positive memory on September 11th. So while September 11th, 2001 was bad, um, September 11th, 2021 um, will hopefully be um, a really positive day for all of us. So um, just, uh, uh, you know, with that in mind, um, let's, let's have a wonderful day today. Let's, let's create a, a positive memory on this September 11th, um, 2021. So Malova, I'll start sharing my screen um, and, uh, and we can go through um, some of our agenda for today. Sounds great. 
Um, so just to, some kind of housekeeping, um, a bit about uh, our, our goals for today. Um, you know, we want to um, educate and inform. We want to discuss medical information, but it's always important to remember that, um, that the information that we're sharing is not direct medical advice. Uh, you should always um, seek uh, advice from a, from a trusted physician that's your doctor who can make decisions related to your particular medical care. Um, but something we can also help with through the CDC, and we can help, help to find someone who's a good fit for you. Um, and then along those lines, during the Q&A sessions, um, trying to make your questions as, as general as they can be and not so specific to, um, should I do this? Um, but, but what should someone, you know, with a scenario like this do? Just because, um, you know, these physicians that we have on the call, they don't know your whole medical history, um, but they, they, we, I, all of us will, will certainly try our best um, to communicate the best information that we have. So this is the same logistics as yesterday. So if you're on yesterday, um, you know that um, we'll be in a webinar format for part of it. Then we're going to break out into breakout sessions. Um, this is Maleva's phone and, and email. You can reach out to her at any time today with any questions. Um, please do keep sharing on social media. We love seeing um, CDCN Summit 2021 on social media. I think it's a great way to um, raise awareness about what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish. We've loved the Warrior Flex photos. They've just been awesome. So um, uh, you can still post throughout today. Um, we're going to share some of them this morning, and then we're going to be announcing the winner um, at the end of the day today. Um, and as, uh, as you probably all know from yesterday, Accelerate has been such a huge part of the progress we've made over the last decade, um, in particular the last five years. And so if you have any questions about Accelerate, you can go to the link at the bottom of the screen. Um, and someone from our team can actually type that link into um, into the chat, so that way you can easily um, click on it and um, and and follow uh, to learn a bit more about Accelerate. So, um, just starting out with some photos from um, CDCN Summit 2021. Um, they uh, were awesome this year. We always have um, have good uh, good pictures on social media from this, but I thought this year's was was maybe extra um, extra special. Um, you can see uh, Katie uh, made her uh, uh, did her her warrior flex in the top right. Though I know Malevo was it was unclear if we were going to get a Katie warrior flex, and I'm glad to see that we got one. <laughs> Um, and of course, we're, uh, warrior photos from, from all over uh, the world. Our Castleman's team um, here at Penn got together uh, after the summit yesterday to celebrate um, what I thought was a really great first day of the summit and come up with a plan for, um, uh, for the next year. So it was really, really awesome to have, um, have our team together. We tried to do a Castleman Warrior Flex ourselves. And then there were some really awesome ones here. Um, there were some some real guns out as part of the Warrior Flex. David Underwood, I think, put all of us to shame. Um, the only one who uh, who's in David Underwood's category is Yankee um, in this particular uh, set of set of photos. Um, although I think Amelia is holding her own okay in the bottom left. That's my it's my sweet Amelia down there in the bottom left doing her Warrior Flex. We just love these Warrior Flexes. I love when you're bringing in family and friends. Um, we call this the Castleman Disease uh, Patient and Loved One Summit um, for a reason, and that's that uh, the Castleman's journey is not just the patient's journey, but it, it's truly um, patients and loved ones. And Malev and I talk about this a lot. We use the term loved ones um, a bit, uh, I guess, uniquely from a lot of uh, other groups. Most groups talk about patients and caregivers. You know, there's people who have a disease and there's caregivers who help them. Um, but we think about it in terms of patients and loved ones, whether it's a parent, a caregiver, a sibling, a child, um, a friend, uh, however loved ones defined. And so I think what I like about these pictures here is that there's a, there are a lot of loved ones um, in these photos. And, uh, and I think that's, that's really true to, to our values. And here's a third set of photos that were posted. And again, please do keep um, posting your photos. Um, they're just awesome. Uh, a bunch of warrior flexes. And again, loved ones are in these photos, which I think um, extra special. Um, and, and of course, awesome scenery. I love Alice's backdrop. Um, these, these are great. And we'll have anything you add about the, these warrior photos? I, it's been so great watching, but I will, I want to comment on Alice's um, one, the post that went along with hers is that she always feels like she wants to hike up to the top of a summit when she takes these, because she really had a climb to get to the top of oh, wow. you know, her journey and being up there really helped her feel that, you know, she's accomplished it. So when I saw that, I was like, that's amazing. Um, but it's just been, it's been so great seeing all these photos come in um, and having all you guys rally around this, this concept and supporting of it. So I love it. Yeah, these are great. And um, I think I particularly love um, the faces that uh, Francis's children are making. They're really, they've got that intense warrior flex face, which um, 
makes me really proud because we all know that it's not just the flex it's also it's also in your face too so i love it debbie's got a great warrior flex face this is there's some blood tubes in there i mean what could be you know that's that's a real ringer right there when you put um, some tubes of blood for research um, into your warrior flex photo that's gonna that's gonna get some extra points for sure nice one well, beloved do you want to um, talk us through um, our plans uh, for today in the agenda sure so um, obviously we're, we're, we're welcome you guys all now. Um, we're gonna kick things over to um, David, who's gonna cover our CDCN impact and kind of really go through what the CDCN has looked like over the last several years and kind of what's on the forefront of our research, what we've accomplished and, and that kind of stuff. We're then gonna dive in with myself and Anya, who is our biomedical leadership fellow. We're gonna talk to you guys about our all in movement project that almost all of you probably have participated in. Um, from there, we're going to go into our Castleman disease and COVID-19 session. Um, so both Dr. David Tegenbaum, he's going to be um, presenting on that. And then we'll have um, a guest presenter or guest um, joining us for the Q&A portion, Dr. Aaron Goodman. He was on yesterday as well. Um, and he will be there to help answer any questions. Um, we will then take a little bit of a break. And that's where we want you guys to order your lunches again. So use those Uber Eats gift cards, um, order yourself some lunch. Um, from there, we're going to be going to two separate links to cover the coping with Castleman disease session. Most of you are familiar with this. So um, if you're a patient, you're going to join the link in your email. Um, Dr. Helen Partridge will be leading that. She will um, really go through some awesome ways to kind of um, develop some coping skills as but then just let you guys kind of talk to each other i'll be doing the same thing with our loved ones um and then from there we will dive into what i love is um our help fight back session this is a session where we talk about all the things that our community can do to join us in the fight anything from you know just being supportive to to doing all of the things you know doting and blood joining accelerate that kind of stuff um then we'll we'll um be led by johnson a member of our team who will be doing our virtual game which is also super fun um be super competitive during that. I want to see everybody um, try to get the answers in quick so you can be on the top leading board for the scores. Um, and then unfortunately, or fortunately, after that, we will be closing things up with announcing all of our winners um, for Castleman Warrior Awards, our Warrior Flex, and then um, David and I will bid you all farewell for the, the, the day. Awesome. Love this. Looks, looks great. Um, think that we've got a lot of good content. And so we'll dump, jump right into um, to the slides now. And I see that people are putting comments into the chat and the Q&A. Keep doing that. Um, anything that comes up and from our side moderators, as we show links, we'll make sure that those links actually get thrown into the chat so you guys can click on them and follow them. So um, I shared a timeline yesterday of kind of uh, Castleman disease before 2012, so before the CDCN was started, um, and then I shared the progress we've made from 2012 to 2021, these last nine years. Um, but I thought I would uh, kind of break that down a little bit more today. Um, and, and of course, it, it's gotten me thinking as I was putting these slides together that um, next year we'll be celebrating 10 years. So I wanted to do um, something big uh, for, the ten, for the 10 year celebration for the CDCN. Um, uh, some of the earlier things that we did in our journey were um, holding a meeting at the annual hematology conference called the American Society of Hematology, bringing together physicians and researchers. Um, we assembled a scientific advisory board of the top experts from around the world. Um, that uh, group currently includes about 30 physicians and researchers from, from around the world, um, representing uh, just about every continent um, and, and certainly uh, patient perspectives from all over the world. Um, Siltuximab became the first uh, FDA approved drug for IMCD in the US in 2014. It also became the first FDA approved drug or EMA approved drug in Europe and, and many other countries that year as well. Um, in 2014, we launched an international research agenda. We um, realized that yes, there's a drug that works for uh, about one third to one half of IMCD patients. And there's a drug rituximab that works quite well for HHV8 positive MCD patients, but there still are a number of unicentric Castleman disease patients that we currently don't know how to treat uh, if they're unresectable or if they are resectable and continue symptoms. And there are IMCD patients who don't respond to siltuximab that we really need to focus our research around. Um, in 2014, we published a, a new classification system for Castleman disease um, that really uh, began to change the way that we thought about how the disease worked. Um, we uh, published a large study describing a new subtype called Tafra syndrome. If you have IMCD, you've probably heard about Tafra syndrome. Um, 
And then in 2016, we also launched Accelerate. That's why we mentioned yesterday that we're closing in on five years. Next month, we'll mark five years since Accelerate started. And it's been um, just an incredible um, aspect of this research. In 2016, we also um, successfully applied for a unique code. Um, Castleman disease didn't have its own code in the International Classification Disease Coding System. And so we advocated for many of you all signed petitions back in 2014, 2015, um, and we got that unique code in 2016. So moving forward, we published the first ever diagnostic criteria for Castleman's disease in 2017. That totally changed diagnosis of Castleman's. When I was diagnosed, there was no checklist. There was no criteria. It was just you had to hope that your doctor had heard about Castleman's, knew what to look for. Um, and, and it really was just hoping that the right person at the right time came in contact with the right patient. Um, and that's certainly not, not what we want. We want this to be um, widespread. Um, in uh, 2017, um, that was also the year that our team uh, was awarded the first ever NIH grant here in the United States to study Castleman disease. Um, we also identified the first set of families of Castleman's patients, um, where there are multiple patients in the same family. Um, we've subsequently learned that this is quite rare. Less than 5% of all Castleman disease patients have another family member with Castleman disease, suggesting this is not a disease that is typically passed on from parent to child. Um, but there are unique um, cases. And we also found that a virus is unlikely to be the, the cause of idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease. But we began to understand different parts of the immune system that were um, perturbed and had were no longer functioning appropriately. In 2018, we published a study where we measured the levels of thousands of proteins in the blood of Castleman's patients. Um, and we found some really interesting results in that. Um, by 2018, we had um, enrolled our 100th patient into Accelerate um, and amazingly found that over 30 different treatments have been tried. And we started to get a sense there may be a regional group, not just unicenter for multicenter, but maybe some patients that kind of fall in between. We discovered some blood tests that can help to predict whether someone's more likely or less likely to benefit from siltuximab. Um, and we also um, came out with the first ever treatment guidelines for IMCD uh, based on data from over 300 patients. Many of you on this call were, were some of those patients that helped to um, lead to this new treatment guidelines. And you can imagine how much this has changed the treatment of Castleman's. Before this, you just had to hope your doctor had some idea about how to treat the disease. Um, now there's actually a formula, there's a, a framework. How do you treat it? You start first with IL-6 blockade. Depending on how severe you are, you get one treatment or another treatment. This, was, this has been just a, a game changer. And we launched a, our Castle Bank Biobank, which many of you all have contributed blood samples to, and I hope you'll consider contributing if you haven't yet. Um, our Speed 2 study, Sheila highlighted that yesterday. Um, uh, we recently published that data and made some really important discoveries. Um, we launched our center at Penn, which has been rebranded as the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory, um, or the CASEL. Um, and the CASEL is uh, um, focused on providing top-notch clinical care to patients from around the world and also adv advancing research and clinical trials for Castleman disease and related conditions. Um, We've described the way that we do our work. We feel it's important to, um, to not just make advances for Castleman's, but to share those advances with other diseases so other disease groups can make similar advances. Um, we made a discovery uh, by a group within the CDCN about the role for a particular gene in unicentric Castleman disease potentially being causative. Um, we've made further discoveries around this a particular communication line called the mTOR pathway that Sheila mentioned yesterday um, that uh, we discovered is a novel therapeutic target. And actually, I was the first patient to begin treatment, treating myself with a drug that inhibits the mTOR pathway and have done really well. Uh, we partnered with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to spread our approach to other rare diseases um, and also open a clinical trial uh, of serolimus. So um, we enrolled patients in the trial. We've identified genetic mutations that may be causative in Castleman's. We expanded out our mTOR research to 26 patients from just the first three, published another study um, identifying another part of the immune system that seemed to be perturbed. Last year, we launched an online discussion board for patients and loved ones um, that can help to promote the sharing of research. If you're not part of CDCN Connect, I hope you'll join and be a part of that. Uh, we launched our Corona project last year, right around the time that COVID-19 emerged. Um, we also had our first major paper from Accelerate published. Um, and uh, 
uh, expanded out our Castleman's uh, program into the CSDL um, and, and, and crossed our, our first 100 samples towards our goal of having over 300 samples from IMCD patients. So if you're if you have IMCD and you haven't provided a blood sample yet, or you're a family member of an IMCD patient that hasn't provided a blood sample yet, I hope you'll consider doing that. Um, we can coordinate all of logistics, but providing that blood sample um, will enable us to be a part of this large study to look into what causes IMCD, and we really do need to increase our numbers for that. Um, in the, towards the end of 2020, we published um, the first ever UCD treatment guidelines, um, and our community has grown uh, tremendously. So what are some highlights from this last year? Well, in the last year, we um, published a study that was pretty clear in showing that you shouldn't use hyaline vascular, plasmacytic, or mixed, whatever your lymph node features look like to guide your treatment decisions. Uh, unfortunately, there's, there's not enough data to support using one of those histological subtypes to, to determine how you should treat patients. And that was a really important finding because a lot of doctors were using one drug for one histopathological subtype, one drug for another one, when really there was no data to support that. Um, we had our big Accelerate um, uh, paper published. Um, we also described the first use of a JAK inhibitor in a Castleman disease patient that was published in The Lancet um, a bit earlier this year, um, and that was directly related to our speed 2 proteomics data. And we published the first ever um, diagnostic and treatment guidelines for unicentric Castleman disease, um, and also um, defined along with a group of colleagues in Japan, um, the first ever uh, international definition for TAFRO, um, which we think is gonna be important for clinical and research purposes. Um, I know that Sheila shared a bit about Speed 2 yesterday, so I'll go through this quickly. But basically, um, Speed 2 was recently published. It's the largest study ever done of idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, measured over 1,000 proteins in the blood of nearly 100 IMCD patients. Many of you all on this call, your samples were included. Um, there were a number of collaborators that came together from all walks of life, from academic institutions to tech companies to, uh, to um, nonprofits to pharmaceutical companies, where we all joined together and contributed our expertise um, we discovered a precision test where we could predict whether someone was more likely or less likely to respond to siltuximab based on seven particular proteins. Now, this is a major discovery, which we validated, which means we showed it to be the case in a separate group. But this is about, 50, uh, about the 50 yard line towards our goal line of being able to have this test clinically available so the doctors could actually run the test on patients. Um, unfortunately, there are many steps from early discoveries all the way through validation and then clinical applicability. Um, but we also discovered that, um, that there could be a new approach for patients who don't respond to siltuximab, and that's these JAK inhibitors. And a number of patients have actually already been, been received JAK inhibitors. Um, and as I mentioned, we had that paper that was published in um, the Lancet. I shared this slide yesterday, so I'll just highlight it briefly, that we've been able to raise a tremendous amount of funding um, for Castleman disease research, um, which led to additional funding from other groups um, and really led to major breakthroughs. Um, we've got a bunch of patients in our contact registry. We hope to bump up our numbers and accelerate with patients. Um, also our biobank getting samples. We've got diagnostic criteria, treatment guidelines, predictive biomarkers. There's now one FDA approved drug, siltuximab, and there are more in development. So what's our formula for success? How did we get to the place that we're in? Well, um, it's really been a combination of patient samples. I was, I guess, patient number one in, in giving my samples to research. I provided a lot of early blood samples and lymph node samples and continue to provide samples, but you can't do research unless you have specimen samples to work on. So those samples um, that literally hundreds of Castleman patients have given lymph node tissue and blood samples towards, um, that's really um, a fundamental piece of this. The next part's data, and that's what we uh, get from Accelerate. So when patients enroll, we get all of their medical records. And so now that blood sample that the patient gave can now be linked to thousands of data points in their medical record. So it's this combination of samples and data that serve as a foundation. But of course, you, you can have all the samples and all the data you want, but without funding, you can't do research. And so, so many of you all have held uh, lemonade stands, you've um, put on events in your communities, you've um, asked your friends and family to donate, and, and, and the funding that you've provided has enabled us to do really important research, which has led to other groups wanting to provide funding for Castleman disease. This is kind of our formula, fund really important research studies, and then those research studies can develop breakthroughs that other groups want to fund to even higher levels. And then finally, of course, it's actually doing the research on the samples, the data, um, and with the funding. This is our formula for success. Um, that leads to breakthroughs. And of course, patients are at the center of all of this. We can't do any of this um, without patients like myself and like, like all of you on the call. Um, so you can go to our research pipeline at any time 
cdcn.org slash research, and you can see how we do research, what our process is. It's actually quite different from the way that most other research organizations do their research. You can also see the status of all of our research studies um, on that website. Um, so these are just a couple of screenshots, but, but I do encourage you to go to the website. If you have any questions, send us an email, um, ask us for some clarification. If you have a question, I'm sure that means someone else reading it will have a question as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Maleva and Anya for um, a bit more about the AIM project and uh, drug repurposing. Thanks, David. So as many of you know, um, we just wrapped up our All In Movement project and just a little bit of background on that, you know, our unique approach to research um, involves engaging our entire community and in doing that, it really helps us push forward the research that we are doing. Um, the reason why our collaborative approach was actually even developed is there was a clear lack in study development, prioritization, collaboration in the rare disease space. And so the CDCN um, I, I like to call them trendsetters, you know, we've done something so different. And the difference is we, um, we integrate every stakeholder, patients, loved ones, physicians, researchers, and, and that's where you guys came in. So step two in our collaborative approach is, you know, crowdsourcing and prioritizing that research. And that's what this all in movement was. We really um, went to all of you and we wanted to know what the heck did you guys need answers to? What, what's going on? What um, you know are the unknowns that you guys struggle with? Um, and so that's that's what we um, that's what drove this um, aim initiative forward, um, and it was fantastic. So Dave, if you go to the next slide, um, the results were amazing. Um, we had all of you guys who joined our new platform CDC and Connect. You guys went in there. You asked a ton of questions. Um, we had 48 people submit ideas. There was 155 ideas submitted in total. Um, 48 people then went back in and voted on those ideas. We then broke them down into 10 broad research categor categories. Of those 155 ideas that were submitted in total, we um, were able to condense them down to about 70. And that wasn't because they um, weren't good ideas. It was a lot of you were asking the same questions or they were along the same lines. So we were able to just kind of condense them. And then in total, we had over a thousand total votes for all of these concepts, which is just amazing. And so from there, um, we took all of those um, votes and we um, turned them over to the scientific advisory board and they met and they went through all of these ideas and they, um, it was really great to see because a lot of what they hear from you guys are what the questions that you guys asked. So there was a lot of um, cohesive alignment that happened there. Um, and then we were able to come up with the top three research studies that we're going to push forward to be funded. And, you know, and this isn't in any particular order, but just the top three are, is JAK inhibition an effective treatment for IMCD patients, refractory to siltuximab and serolimus, or UCD patients with unresectable disease? What treatment options are available for patients who have a failed or incomplete response to um, anti-IL-6 therapy, and why doesn't that work? Um, and then what biomarkers can be used to improve diagnosis, tracking, preventing relapse, and predicting treatment response for IMCD and UCD? These are all great questions. And so these are the top three that are being pushed forward to, um, for funding. We're looking for researchers who can actually drive forward this research. Um, and, and then from there, all of the additional questions that were asked, you guys can find on our website, cdcn.org aim 2021. There is the top 20 list, but we're also gonna add all of the questions that were asked. Um, and this, it doesn't stop here. So from here, we're actually going to continue this, you know, keep those questions coming. You know, this is driving forward our next phase of research, which is fantastic, but research ne never ends when it's an unknown rare disease like this. So we are gonna do the same initiative again. We're gonna come back to you guys and ask, what are the questions you have that you want answered? And we're gonna keep this going, which is really great. Um, and and um, I'm gonna turn this over to Anya, who's an amazing member of our team. But one of the things that you guys may remember from last summit, we, we talked about our partnership with CZI. Um, CZI is who partnered with us and um, helped us develop the CDC and Connect platform that allowed us to have this AIM initiative. And from there, we then partnered with them again this year in a really important drug repurposing project that um, Anya is actually leading. And so I'm gonna turn things over to her to kind of talk through that. Thank you, Malava. So hello, everyone. I'm really excited um, to tell you about this roadmap initiative um, that, as Malava said, is supported by the a grant from CCI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and it's really taking what uh, the CDCN has this amazing experience with drug repurposing. Um, and if for those of you that are not familiar, drug repurposing is the idea that there, there's about 2,500 drugs that are already approved by the FDA for certain diseases. But you can, once they are FDA approved for something, they can be used for other diseases off label. So for something else that they're not approved for. And drug repurposing is just the broader idea of taking that 
doing additional research and seeing maybe to get them approved for something like Castleman disease, um, or maybe just supporting with more evidence to, to patients like you to use them off label. So this, the so CDCN has this wonderful experience of drug repurposing sirolimus and now a JAK inhibitor. Um, if you're not familiar with that story, there's a book you can read called Chasing My Cure. Um, my Dr. David, David Fagenbaum, I highly recommend it. Um, but this, the CDCN has this wonderful experience, but there's, um, we're just one of about 800 organizations that are, that are these rare disease organizations supporting um, patients like you in the US, um, supporting a, almost uh, 7,000 rare diseases worldwide. And there's all these organizations and so some of them may have um, experience with drug repurposing, but maybe are not successful. Maybe some of them are successful and have things to share like the CDCN. Some of them maybe don't even know about drug repurposing and that it is a fast and easy, well, not quite easy, but easier than new drug development. Um, as it's an easier pathway to get treatments faster to patients than new drug development. Um, and some of them maybe are interested, but don't know how to start. So, there's all these organizations in the US and there's this opportunity to connect them, to learn um, from each of their experiences, from each of their very specific patient, loved one, researcher, physician networks, but they're a little bit separate. There's not a systematic effort to try to combine and learn from each other. So this is basically what um, we want to, to do in the roadmap initiative. Um, as there's no clear roadmap of what are the steps for successful drug repurposing for a rare disease organization and for a rare disease patient community. Um, so we really want to identify those organizations, try to learn from them and see if they, we can identify the steps, but also some of the challenges and some of the solutions so we can all kind of learn from each other's experience. We can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, as everything's an acronym with CDCN, so the roadmap stands for repurposing of all drugs, mapping all paths. Um, and these are kind of the two goals. So gathering the experiences from not only these organizations I mentioned, but also from their patient, loved one, research and community um, to really learn from each other. So each and every experience is not lost, um, but really aggregated and, and shared with, um, with the whole rare disease community as a whole. And then taking all of this data and all these experiences and building a tool to help support drug repurposing, not only for the CDCN, but also for other diseases as a whole. And here I can I put some of the logos of organizations that are already on board. We're hoping um, to have a very large impact. So as many of the 800 organizations that we can get on board. Um, and this mountain metaphor I just wanted to mention is the idea that we're building this from the ground up. So there's not um, a roadmap that's been given to us by like the FDA or the NIH or someone would be like, this is how to do drug repurposing. That doesn't exist. So we can, we, there is, but there are all this, all this rich data just out there ready to be harvested. So we're trying to collect it and build this, um, this roadmap from the ground up. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So where do you come in? So there's multiple ways you can help support this work. So keep an eye out. Hopefully the survey that we are starting this work with uh, will be available next week. Fingers crossed. So keep an eye out for an email with a link to that. Um, anyone in our community can participate. So if you're an adult patient, you can take it yourself. If you're a loved one of a patient who's under 18, you can take it on their behalf. Um, if you have the physicians, physicians, researchers, and obviously we'll take it as a representative of the CDCN as well. You can also spread the word. We're going to be posting on social media. You can repost them. If you happen to be in multiple organizations, maybe you have multiple rare diseases, you can also encourage your organization, your other organization to participate. Any other patients you know, loved ones, just help us spread the word, word because as many experiences we can gather, um, the more we can learn. So we really can use your help there. And also you can volunteer to help us directly. Um, as you know, the, the Corona project, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute for COVID, started as a volunteer effort. And the, the power of crowdsourcing is really numbers. So a little, a lot of people do a little bit at a time. And we're, we have a volunteer team working on this project as well, just looking at our, these organizations' websites and extracting information. So it's a very easy lift. You don't have to have a medical background. You don't need a lot of time. Volunteers can, can just give a little bit, at a, a couple hours a week, um, just to help us with this data. So what I have the names of our current little mini army on the screen. So thank you. This includes a couple of patients as well. Um, and also, of course, help. Uh, thank you for all the help with uh, from Johnson and Malala, our superstar our team on this on this project. And I think that concludes our a little presentation here and we're open to um, questions.
Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Anya. Um, and I know that uh, we got started a, a little bit late, so um, we probably all were going a little quick during the session to make sure that we we got through on time. But just to emphasize for the team, um, this is such an important project um, for for two reasons. One is that um, all of the drugs that any of us have ever gotten for Castleman disease, every single one of them except for Sultuximab was developed for something else. There was no intention for it to ever be used for Castleman disease, but research done by our group and others figured out that um, that other drug made for something else could actually be helpful for Castleman disease. And so very directly, there are drugs out there that are already helping patients that are, have been repurposed like serolimus that's helping me um, and like rituximab and like so many others are helping other patients with various forms of Castleman disease. So it's already something that has helped the Castleman's community. It's something that can help the Castleman disease community more, moving forward. And then just as, as Ani emphasized, we really want to help other rare diseases too. We've been, we've been very fortunate and successful um, with uh, drug repurposing for Castleman's. Um, the idea that our approach and what we learn from this effort can be helpful for other rare diseases is really, really meaningful to us. But we really, but just like Accelerate and just like Biobank, we can't learn about the Castleman's approach unless uh, you guys contribute to the survey. So, so as, as Anya said, that survey will be going out um, uh, soon. And, um, and once that survey goes out, um, I hope many of you guys will just take the time. I think it's like a, a 10 to 15 minute survey, something to that effect for patients. And um, I hope you'll take the survey and that um, you'll share about your experience with drug repurposing. Oftentimes people don't even realize that they're on a repurposed drug because their doctor told them about it. So, hey, it must've been for Castleman's. But the reality is, is that for rare diseases, drugs are rarely developed specifically for those rare diseases. Our best shot is when something's developed for something else and then you repurpose it and try it in a, in a new way. Um, Anya, Malava, anything else that you'd add um, related to either the impact uh, that we talked about, AIM or Roadmap before we open it up to a couple minutes of questions? All I'll add for the roadmap is that, um, you know, I've had patients across, you know, multiple organizations that we've been talking to um, just, you know, at, or even the representatives ask, like, what would we, could we possibly learn from them when we're, you know, at the forefront of doing so much? And the reality is, you know, what I've been saying is we have blinders on to just what the CDCN is doing. And, and, you know, so we're super focused on us. And even when we, you know, go one arm length out to you guys, um, I know only Katie's experience and, you know, the things that we've done for her in each and every single one of you, I know we always say that you have one piece of the puzzle to help us get a, get a cure for Castleman disease. You guys also have so much knowledge on your battle, your, um, path that you've taken that we, though I chat with all of you as much as I possibly can have no idea about. And so when you take this survey, it really allows us to learn how many bumps you hit in that road, what that path looked like, and then how can we as an organization for not just CDCN, but for all of these other rare diseases, make that a smoother path to get people the right drugs that they need so much faster. Um, and so I, I think if you can spare those 10 to 15 minutes, it's just such a great way for us to not just help ourselves, but help so many others and really make it a really good impact here. Nice, well, um, let's open it up to some questions. Um, feel free to throw them into the chat or the Q&A. Um, and Johnson, maybe if you, um, if you wanna unmute and let us know if there's any, any chat comments to, to bring up. Yeah, of course, thank you. And thank you for all of those great presentations that just came in. Um, so in terms of questions, we have one question about the roadmap thus far. Um, and the, the question asks, is the roadmap just for the US or are we doing an international search as well? So if you wanna take that on, yeah. Good question. So we are focused just on the US for now because there's so much variation in the regulatory body. So we're just focused on drug repurposing as supported by the FDA. Once we start looking abroad, um, you know, the UK has their own, Europe has their own, Japan has their own. It just gets very complicated very quickly. So for this initial stage, we're hoping to build this out for the US so it can be directly, directly applicable for organizations, these 800 that were captured here. But hopefully um, in next iterations, we can start to expand um, and do a global. Um, that's the kind of the dream of a global uh, roadmap um, to help support, you know, patients abroad as well. But it's, you can um, you can still participate in other ways. Um, for sure, you can you can give us you can take the surveys at your experience as our one of our since the organization is based in the U.S. You can still take it as a patient, um, and you can also help in the other ways as well. 
Yeah, that's a great Thank point. I hadn't much, thought about yeah. that. Yeah, that's a great point about other, uh, you know, people in other countries that have Castleman disease can absolutely complete the survey and share about drugs that they get. And during one of our breakouts yesterday, there were some discussions about um, the challenges if you're in other countries and maybe accessing some of these repurposed drugs. It's a little bit more challenging often, um, but it'd be great to learn from. Yes, sir. So this question, uh, it's probably best for David to answer but some of our patients are asking, what's the criterion for classifying a disease as a rare disease or an orphan disease? Oh. And does Castleman fit in there? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, so the general number in the, in the United States is that you have to have less than 200,000 patients alive at any one time. If you have less than 200,000 people alive with a disease and you're considered a rare slash orphan disease, rare and orphan are interchangeable terms. Um, and so that means that if it's 200,000 alive, and that either means it's a fairly common disease, but people die in a very short period of time after diagnosis, which means that there's a smaller number that are alive, or it's a very rare disease where patients may live longer or shorter. Um, and so that's kind of uh, how you fall into that definition. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And then we'll toss one question over to Maleva before we run out of time so we can move on to our next session. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about how the CDC can help patients find uh, physicians that are around them? Because we have a couple of patients who are asking about physicians in Puerto Rico and in different places of the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, the best way to do that is to reach out to me. So we have a list of expert physicians who are on our referral list. Um, and these are experts who, you know, haven't just seen one or two patients. They um, not only see patients regularly, but also um, connect with the CDC and they collaborate collaborate with us regularly. I have that list willing to share and help provide any of these um, expert physicians to all of you. In addition to that, we also just have a, a database of physicians all over the world who have let us know that they are treating patients. So if on our expert physician referral list, there is a physician that is not close to you and you're looking for somebody else, let me know. And I will try to find out if there are any other physicians that are closer to you and give you as many options as I possibly can. And with um, in addition to that, the center at Penn also has Dr. Nass and Dr. Cohen, who are fantastic. We are always willing and able to help facilitate, um, you know, trying to get you guys appointments here if you're willing to travel. And then obviously Dr. Fritz Van Rie, who's in Arkansas, um, leading expert in Castleman disease as well. So um, I know many of our patients can't travel, but I also know many of you are, are wanting to travel to these experts. So I'm happy to provide any information that I can to help you guys. Yeah, you know, we, you very much. we put so many different email addresses and links into the chat, um, you know, between yesterday and today to, you know, email this person for this, call this person for that. The reality is, if you just reach out to any one of the numbers, particularly the numbers or the email address on the screen, if you reach out to info at castlenetwork.org about anything, I, I can guarantee you that we'll either have an answer for you or we can direct you in, in the right direction. And um, it's, it's great that I can say that now in 2021, because of course, when we started in 2012, uh, I would have said, we don't have any answers for you. Uh, we can, um, you know, we'll try our best, but we don't, we don't have any answers. And so we've got a lot more answers today. We certainly don't have answers to everything, but do, do reach out to us. Um, if you're not sure about something, if you don't even know if it's something that we can help with, just reach out and, and we'll, we'll do the best that we can to help. Fantastic. So now we're going to move into our next session about COVID-19 and Castleman disease. But one really quick point is that there are a couple questions regarding donated samples. And the best person to talk to about all of that would be Bridget, our uh, biobank coordinator. Her number is in our slide somewhere, but if you want to email her, it'll be castlebank at uphs.upin.edu. I put it in as an answer to a question. So any questions about donating, send them all to Bridget. And she'll be more than happy to help. Nice. Thank Thanks, Johnson. Much. And will you also put the biobank phone number into the chat as well? And I know I and the other thing too is we'll, we'll be sending all the stuff out to you guys, but the bottom line is I don't want you guys to feel confused about which link, which phone number, which email address. You just reach out to one of them and we'll get it to the right person. Um, I, I guarantee that. Great. So I'm going to start out um, my COVID-19 talk. Um, and, uh, you know, as I was thinking about the first couple slides of the talk, just a bit background on COVID, of course, I realized that um, that we all know uh, the background of COVID. We, um, there, there's no way you can live in this world without being aware of the morbidity and mortality associated with this pandemic. But, but as of August 20th, when I put the slide together, um, there were over uh, 4 million deaths uh, um, across the world. 
Um, and there were uh, uh, significant numbers, over 600,000 deaths in the United States since the start of the pandemic. So we all know it's a challenge. Um, we all have heard more than we could ever want to hear about coronaviruses and, um, and about uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, but I did wanna highlight a little bit around what we now know today based off some of the work that we've done through the Corona Project. And that's that SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that cause, causes COVID, is not entirely responsible. In fact, it's, it's not even mostly responsible for the deadliness associated with COVID. In fact, it's actually not so much the virus, but actually the immune response to the virus that makes COVID-19 um, so deadly and why patients get so sick. So on the left side of the screen, it's a very complicated diagram to highlight that um, if you look on, the, on that particular image, there are some virus particles um, that are being inhaled by the, by the model on the left side of the screen. Um, but then what you'll notice is that pretty much everything else in the diagram, those are actually human immune cells. So, so the, the COVID-19 um, effects are, are, are in, they're all triggered by SARS-CoV-2, um, but the symptoms and the deadliness of SARS-CoV-2 are related to how your immune system responds to it. And so part of why this virus is so deadly is that it, it, it's very good at evading the immune system. It's very good at, at tricking the immune system. And so um, what you really want is that appropriate response to the virus. As you know, a lot of people um, are asymptomatic when they get SARS-CoV-2, and that's because their immune system had a perfect response to it. It, it, it. it turned on when it needed to, it turned off when it needed to, it controlled the virus, and the patient got better without even knowing they ever got sick. That's, that's the goal. But unfortunately, for a large portion of people, um, we will either have too weak of an immune response, uh, maybe if we're on immunosuppressants like rituximab or other drugs like serolimus, we'll have too weak of a response to the, uh, to the virus, and that will enable the virus to get out of control and to have more and more viral particles, which will stimulate the immune system, and it'll become an uncoordinated response. Or some people will just have too aggressive a response from the very beginning. They... Um, will produce too many cytokines. Um, the Castleman's community is very well aware of the term cytokine and cytokine storm because we've known for decades that cytokines and cytokine storm are what causes the problems in Castleman disease. Um, but here in COVID, it's become clear that it's actually those same cytokines, the same cytokine storm um, that leads to the deadliness of SARS-CoV-2. So what does illness with COVID-19 look like? Well, it's a respiratory virus. And so um, the part of your body that is first um, affected by SARS-CoV-2 infection is going to be your lungs, uh, it's going to be a cough, it's going to be a sore throat, um, sort of the typical flu-like symptoms. Um, but unfortunately, for some people, um, the symptoms go beyond just the localiza localization to the respiratory tract and patients experience um, multi-organ failure, very similar to what we see in TAFRA patients, liver failure, kidney failure, bone marrow shutdown, um, respiratory failure. These are the things that propagate from the fact that the immune response is really out of control in an effort to control the virus. So as we talked about yesterday, your immune system should turn on, fight off the invader, and then it should turn off. That's kind of the way it should work. But in SARS-CoV-2, it's slow to turn on. The immune system slow to turn on because the virus is very good at evading it. And then by the time it turns on, there's so much virus there because it's been hiding for so long that the immune system will just kind of explode in an effort to, to control the virus. And in doing so, all of its favorite cytokines and, and molecules that, it, that the immune system uses to kill a virus, those cause collateral damage all over the body. And so it's not an issue of just too weak or just too strong. It's really about having that, that optimized immune response, which unfortunately is not, is not often the case in COVID. So we talked about how there's overlap in symptoms. Um, uh, and of course, uh, you know, it's really important for people who are immunocompromised, people who are on drugs for their Castleman disease to be aware um, that we may be um, late to show symptoms. And so we need to be really on top of our symptoms because the earlier we determine that someone has COVID, the earlier you can get them monoclonal antibodies, which are very effective at, at stopping the disease in its tracks. Um, if you get the monoclonal antibodies too late, um, then it's too late. And so um, and you're, you're at high risk of going on to be hospitalized. The good news is, is that through the Corona Project and through our work, we've identified a number of drugs that are highly effective in COVID that if given at the right time, um, you can significantly limit your risk of death. Um, and this is just a bit about cytokine, cytokine storm. So cytokines are, are these proteins that your immune system uses to help to fight off 
um, invaders and also to, to communicate with other immune cells. Uh, cytokine storm is the term we use when um, the immune system is truly out of control and there are excessive levels of cytokines. So here we have a picture of a Castleman's patient experiences a cytokine storm on a ventilator um, uh, in the ICU on dialysis. This particular Castleman's patient actually happens to be on the, on the Zoom call today, um, but this is an IMCD patient. And this is a COVID patient looking quite similar to a really sick IMCD patient. And I'm so thrilled that, that my good friend and the, COVID, the Castleman's patient here um, is on the call doing so well these days. So as, as we said earlier, it's really about balance, um, balance of the immune system. Um, and then I'm gonna skip this and get right to treatment. So um, there are a lot of drugs that have been used for COVID thus far. Um, in fact, over 500 drugs have been reported to be given to COVID patients. Um, and we track that through the Corona Project and anyone can access that information. Um, what's clear is that there are a number of drugs that are highly effective if given at the right time. If you give the right drug at the wrong time, it won't help. And if you give the wrong drug at any time, it's not gonna help. But if you get the right drug at the right time, they can be really, really effective. And so um, if you believe that you've been infected with SARS-CoV-2, you've been exposed to someone with SARS-COV-2 and have a positive test result, um, then the best thing you can do is get to an infusion clinic to get monoclonal antibodies from either Regeneron or Eli Lilly. They're highly effective. In fact, they reduce hospitalization by 80 to 90%. So, so that's the first, um, first kind of barrier to, um, to a bad outcome from COVID is, is early diagnosis, early use of monoclonal antibodies. If you get monoclonal antibodies and you fall into the small percentage that still goes on to be hospitalized, or you don't get the monoclonal antibodies, then now that you're hospitalized, the first thing that you should receive is remdesivir upon hospitalization. Remdesivir is another effective drug if given at the right time. If you continue to progress despite being on remdesivir to needing oxygen, the next thing you need is dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is highly effective if given to patients who are on oxygen in the hospital. And if despite being on dexamethasone, you then end up getting transferred to the intensive care unit, the next thing you should get is tocilizumab. Tocilizumab, of course, was developed by our good friend Kazuya Shizaki for Castleman disease back in the 90s. It was made for Castleman's. It's now first line for ICU patients with COVID, but TOSI should be the first thing you get when you move to the ICU. And throughout your hospitalization, um, you should likely also be on varying doses of heparin to prevent um, thromb thromboses. And so what I'm highlighting here is that there are drugs that are really, really effective at various stages of, um, of COVID. And if you were to actually follow those steps and take those drugs at those times, you would reduce your risk of death to um, a very, very, very small number. Um, and that's why it's important to, to be very aware of things. Um, of course, there's other ways to reduce your risk of death from COVID. Um, so one of them certainly is social distancing. Um, if you live in a cave, you can't get COVID. You know, if you live um, under a rock, you can't get COVID because you won't be, you won't interact with people, but because all of us interact with people, trying our best to distance ourselves um, is, is, is probably the best thing you can do. Um, maybe next is, is wearing good masks, so surgical masks, not cloth masks, um, are going to help with preventing the virus um, from spreading. Um, and then vaccines. Um, of course, uh, we're all um, well aware of uh, the effect, the highly effective vaccines that are available across the United States and other parts of the world as well. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure many of you all will have questions for Aaron and myself um, about specifically thinking about and making decisions around vaccines. I can tell you the way that I've thought about getting a vaccine for COVID and, and, and how I made my decision um, was at first, I was very concerned about the idea of taking um, this vaccine. Uh, and then I did a lot of weighing the risks and benefits. And I said, okay, I've got this immune system disorder where I'm at high risk of, of, of a poor outcome of, frankly, of death if I were to be infected with SARS-CoV-2, um, and there's an unclear but low risk of a bad outcome if I were to get this vaccine. And so doing that sort of cost-benefit analysis it became really clear for me that rather than a high risk of death and bad outcome with getting the virus, I'd rather a low risk um, with the vaccine. And now it's important to also remember that the best outcome would probably be to get neither, right? Neither the virus nor the vaccine, that would be great. But given the widespread nature of the virus, unless you want to live in a cave, that's not an option. And so um, this is really, really um, important for, uh, for thinking about how, how you make a decision here. So um, I'm going to quickly highlight some uh, results from the COVID-19 survey that we sent out to Castleman's patients. If you, have, if you are in Accelerate and you have not completed the five-minute survey about COVID, I really, really encourage you to consider doing it. Many Castleman's patients are worried about what will happen if they get COVID. They're worried about 
um, how the vaccine will, will affect them. And unless more people contribute to the survey, we won't know. And so, you know, our survey results are only as good as the number of people that actually can respond to the survey, but I'll at least share, share the results. Um, so um, we sent the survey out to 298 patients that are in Accelerate. A third of patients responded. Um, out of the 69 patients that were ever tested for uh, COVID, 10 of them tested positive. So about 14% um, positive rate at any time um, during the course of the, of, uh, of the pandemic. Fortunately, um, the good news is that there was a similar distribution to the general population. So two out of 10 patients were asymptomatic. Seven out of 10 patients had a mild case where they felt they felt badly, but they didn't have to be hospitalized. And only one out of 10 patients um, that ever had a COVID positive test um, required hospitalization. Um, so that's really good news, right? When, when this pandemic first emerged, I was worried it was going to be, you know, everyone was going to be, um, you know, needing to be hospitalized if they had Castleman disease. But it's important to recognize that out of the 10 cases, um, three of them were IMCD, one HHV positive, and six QCD. So um, if those breakdowns differ, we might have had different, um, different results. Um, uh, then thinking about um, the vaccine, um, uh, most of the patients had received at least one dose. This uh, survey was first sent out a few months ago, so I, I think that it's probably higher um, at this stage. Um, and there were seven patients who paused treatment during the vaccination period. I'm one of those patients. I actually um, decided to stop my serolimus for a few days before I got the vaccine and stayed off serolimus for about 10 days after the vaccine to make sure that I would have my best chance of a good response to the vaccine to make a lot of antibodies. Um, but that's certainly not something that's recommended or, or agreed upon. It's just what, what I, and it looks like six other patients, um, along with our doctors, decided to do. Um, most patients experience mild symptoms um, with shoulder pain being the most common symptom um, from their vaccine. Uh, but fortunately, there were no hospitalizations and no serious um, issues in the 87 patients who got the vaccine. Among unvaccinated patients, two patients planned to get the vaccine, five were unsure, and seven did not plan to get the vaccine um, due to concerns about interaction between Castleman disease and the vaccine. And so that's why it's important to have more people complete the survey so we can get a sense for, are there really reasons to be concerned about the two thus far? Um, it does not look like that's the case. And so again, um, let us know if you're in Accelerate and you didn't take the, uh, the survey, we'll send you another version of it and we'll look forward in your email. All right, so now I want to welcome my, my good friend and colleague, Aaron, um, who's on the webinar right now. Um, Aaron, welcome. Uh, uh, welcome from Philadelphia. I'm assuming you're, um, you're home in San Diego. Yeah, I'm here in San Diego. It's a little earlier here, but we're here. Well, thanks, thanks so for much. For, thanks for being on. We're, we're thrilled to have you. So, Aaron, what I thought we could do now is there are a number of questions that have come up a lot that we consider these kind of frequently asked questions. And so maybe the two of us can talk through answers to FAQs. And then, um, and then if uh, anyone who's watching wants to throw questions into the chat, we can get to your questions once we get through the FAQs, but we can start with the frequently asked questions. Um, so the first one is, are all Castleman disease patients considered to be immunosuppressed and highly susceptible to acquiring SARS-CoV-2? I'll, I'll touch on that first. I want to hear your thoughts, Aaron. Um, based on, on my review of the data, it's pretty clear that Castleman's patients that are on immunosuppressive drugs are immunosuppressed and are susceptible to having a, a more serious um, uh, COVID uh, our poor COVID outcome. However, um, we do not have data to clearly indicate that patients who have any form of Castleman disease, um, but they're not on medication, that they're going to be um, at higher risk, except for HHV positive MCD. We can feel pretty confident if you have HHV positive MCD, you probably have some immunocompromise. But otherwise, um, it's really about the drugs. Would you, would you agree with that? Anything else that you'd add? Yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, we don't have the data yet, but, but, um, you know, and, I, and just my other chat is I'm a bone marrow transplant doctor. I take care of lots of immunosuppressed patients. And I think, you know, I think I'm fairly confident if you have unicentric Castleman's disease and are not on therapy, that there should be no reason you're at increased risk for a serious COVID. Yep. Um, for those with IMCD um, in remission, um, you know, on an IL-6 inhibitor, um, I'm pretty comfortable they're going to have not a, a much higher risk. You know, we're using these drugs anyways to, to help fight COVID, yep. uh, but we don't have the data, but I'm not as worried. I would say for the IMCD patients on rituximab, yes. uh, um, which is uh, uh, which will suppress your antibody response, uh, yes, uh, you will be, I think, at higher risk for COVID and more precautions necessary. I don't know if you share those opinions, David. 
I 100% do. And, and Aaron, is do you have a go-to kind of prophylaxis for your patients that are on rituximab? Do you recommend anything for your patients on rituximab? Yeah. So it depends on how long they're going to be on rituximab for. And I use a lot of rituximab for lymphomas. Fortunately, I don't actually use it too much anymore for calcimens unless uh, they're failing IL-6 therapy. Um, but if it's a finite course of rituximab and they haven't been vaccinated yet, I wait a few months. Uh, so I tell them, I go, you should probably be a little bit more isolated than the normal yep. person uh, masking up. And a few months after I'll start the vaccination program. If they're going to be on rituximab indefinitely, which we do have to do sometimes, tell them to get the vaccination. Um, what, it, it's not going to be more dangerous, the vaccine. The risk is that it just might not work as well. And then they just have to know the knowledge that they're one of these higher risk patients. And uh, there's no really prophylactic medicine other than unfortunately masking and, and, and being more cautious. Now, I don't want my patients not to have a life. I, you know, And that's where there's the fine balance and it's a discussion with my patients about the risk benefits of certain situations, but it's tough. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, Aaron. I was specifically thinking about one patient in particular who I know has been on rituximab for his IMCD. He um, got the vaccine, he got an antibody test, came back negative, so he didn't make antibodies. Um, and, uh, and, and him and I had been speaking and, and looking at some data around these monoclonal antibodies actually as preventative. So, so there are studies to suggest that if you get an infusion of the same things that you would take if you were newly infected with SARS-CoV-2, you can actually take them as a prophylaxis if you're a quote unquote high risk patient. So it's something to consider for your patients where you know that they're, they didn't make an antibody response to SARS-CoV or to the vaccine, um, but they're, you're worried about their risk, particularly if it's someone who's maybe older or has comorbidities, then you can consider um, an infusion or a periodic infusions of these monoclonal antibodies from Regeneron. Definitely no data in IMCD in particular, but there is some good data from healthcare workers that that you can prevent um, you can prevent getting COVID by by giving someone monoclonals as a prophylaxis. Cool. So then the next question would be: Should I stop my calcium disease treatment to help prevent my becoming ill with COVID nineteen? What's your recommendation, Aaron? What do you what do you say about about preventing uh, or stopping treatment? I mean, it's really going to be patient specific and you know, how severe things were, but, you know, if you just started siltuximab uh, after a very serious flare, uh, I'm not going to recommend stopping it. Um, if you're two or three years in and doing great, I think it's a risk benefit situation um, or at least further spacing out, which we do. But again, we don't know if those interventions are going to be of any benefit. And I would suggest that those patients who are two to three years out in a nice remission on siltuximab are probably fairly low risk. So um, my rule of thumb is um, if there's any therapy that I would stop because of COVID, then maybe I shouldn't be giving it anyways. And, and yep. so there's no one right answer. I totally agree with you on that. I think that, you know, right now there, there's no data to say that you should stop your Castleman's treatment and, and really, um, you know, you should, should have these sort of discussions with your doctor. All right, so then another question that comes up often is, even if it's not clear if Castleman's disease patients are susceptible to COVID, what should I do to, to lower my risk? And I think that, you know, all of us have heard the guidelines, um, and I think that we could probably skip over this, because I think we all know, wash your hands, be socially distant, wear a mask, don't touch your face. Um, if you feel sick, stay home. These are, the, these are the, the really, you know, clear things that we should all do. So even if it's not clear that Castleman's disease patients are highly susceptible to COVID, what can I do to lower my risk? So unfortunately, there's no clear data that any vitamins or supplements, uh, we were very hopeful early on that vitamin D might actually um, be effective. But unfortunately, those studies have not turned out um, to demonstrate a benefit of vitamin D. But just as we would say for any patient with anything, you can always do things to, to eat right and to exercise, lower your stress. Um, there's no clear data that these are effective um, in preventing or helping um, with your COVID. But certainly, uh, I think it's something that I recommend. And I, and I, I think that, you know, Things that are good for you or are good for you. Um, anything that you'd add to that, Aaron? No, I, I think you, you, yeah. I mean, I wish we had more, but I, I things that are good for you, as you said, are, are good for you. We should continue these healthy habits. I'm not sure if it's my connection here, but I lost you for a second. It might, it might have been mine. I'm not sure if it was yours or mine. Uh, can you hear me now? Darn. I think it's my connection. We can hear you, Dr. Goodman. Okay. I think it was my connection. <laughs> a bad connection, but um, maybe I'll turn it to you, Aaron, to hit this really big question around the third. 
Yeah, I, so you're breaking up. Hopefully everyone can hear me. But um, of course, David leaves me with the, the, the hardest question here. <laughs> uh, should, <laughs> thank you. So should I get the third dose booster? So the CDC is currently recommending anyone on an immune suppressive drug to get the third dose of vaccine. So here, here's what I tell my patients. And again, you know, the majority of my, I do take care of a lot of Castleman's, but I take care of a lot of uh, uh, leukemia, lymphoma, and stem cell transplant patients. And um, what we know for sure, and I need David to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, um, is that the third booster seems to raise your antibody response when you check. Uh, so, so what I mean by antibody response, it will rev up your, your healthy B cells to make more antibodies uh, against proteins uh, that are part of the COVID-19 virus. And it, it, it looks better on paper on the computer screen. Uh, you'll see a better uh, titer against these, these proteins. Now, the endpoint that matters to me and I think to most individuals is, uh, does it prevent se severe COVID-19, meaning getting sick, hospitalized, and or death? And um, I don't think we have that exact answer yet with the booster. We know the vaccine does. There's no doubt about it, get the vaccine. But whether the third dose does that, I don't think we know for sure. But that being said, I am recommending it to my patients because if you've gotten two doses of it, of it and you haven't had any major issues uh, with the vaccine, the third dose isn't going to pose, in my opinion, a much bigger risk. And there is a potential benefit, but it's just like anything we do in, me in medicine, a risk benefit situation. And um, if I had a patient say, I absolutely don't want the third dose, then okay, I'm willing to accept that. Uh, but if the same patient came to me and said, I don't want the vaccine at all, then I'm really going to push. I mean, I do believe in this vaccine, uh, but I just, we're still waiting to learn more about the third booster. That being said, I am recommending it. And it's an individual talk with my, my patients. And, and I plan on getting it too for myself when it's available uh, for healthcare workers. David, are you on or? Are you able to hear me? I'm sorry, I'm having some audio difficulties. Can you hear me now? I can yes, hear we you. Can. So I could hear you well, Aaron, and I hope that you guys can hear me. I, I think that I, I totally agree with you, Aaron, that, um, that there's, there's too. Um, I have not personally made a decision yet as to what I'm doing with my third. I, I thought long but I am um, hesitant um, on what to do about this third booster dose, but I will um, share with It's, there's no reason to believe that the third dose is going to cause problems if your first two doses. For me, it's more just that get the dose uh, and, and I don't necessarily want to go off um, my, my uh, drugs for two. Uh, next question is around, should I stop taking my dose around the vaccine or my treatment around the vaccine dose? Most patient to have, um, to have with your doctor. Um, so then uh, I heard the TOSI My risk of developing COVID is lower um, if I'm currently being treated with TOSI or siltuximab. I mean, right now we don't that, uh, um, you know, we hope it doesn't worsen your, your, um, your risk. Maybe I'll, I'll stick it over, or again, I'll send it over to Aaron. I'm gonna, um, on the stock of TOSI or siltuximab while I try to actually get audio. You know, Dave, Dave, I'll, I'll just take it until someone tells me to stop because uh, uh, of David's uh, internet connection. So, um, you know, will tocilizumab and siltuximab be in stock? So, um, you know, um, uh, I keep on repeating. So there actually right now, there's no issues with siltuximab that I'm aware of. Um, I will say with tocilizumab, um, we have had, I use a lot of this drugs being used a lot in the ICUs for severe COVID. It's also used for um, what are called CAR T cells and other therapies that result in severe cytokine release syndromes, much like Castleman's disease. And uh, there have been some issues uh, uh, getting uh, post uh, um, or, you know, our hospital to give certain therapies that we give has to have vials on stock. And I know there's been some issues, but there has not been any issues with siltuximab. So uh, I largely believe the two are interchangeable if you must. So if you're on tocilizumab and need a few doses of siltuximab, I don't think it's the end of the world. And, and, uh, and again, for the majority of the patients on siltuximab for the Castleman's, I don't see there being uh, a, a, an issue uh, with stock right now. 
Thanks um, so much, Aaron. And I've got my I've got phone audio now, so I, hopefully it's not okay, going to cut out it. any longer. <laughs> I think we're we're towards the end of our FAQs, but this kind of gets to Aaron's point around it's it's unlikely that there is going to be um, a shortage of siltuximab for Castleman's patients, but um, but we are certainly you know staying on top of this. Um, and if there is a shortage, then it's going to be really important um, that you connect with your doctor and also connect with any doctors that we can recommend through the CDCN um, about what to do. We're going to closely follow the potential for there being a shortage of either of those two. And so um, we are at the end of the FAQs. We don't have tons of time for additional questions, but if you want to put some questions in the chat, Maleva or Johnson, if you guys want to highlight any questions to our group, and then I and I did forget uh, fail to um, to give uh, Dr. Goodman the opportunity to introduce himself. I think that you all now know how how impressive he is from hearing um, the way that he thinks about Castleman's. But Dr. Goodman, would you want to share a little bit about yourself and and where you uh, practice? Yeah, of course. So I, I'm out in California in sunny San Diego. Uh, so if you guys ever move out there or come out to live, I'm happy to help take care of anyone. Um, um, so I'm at the university um, and I'm a malignant, I take care of blood cancers, bone marrow transplantation, cellular therapies. And um, uh, just a, the real brief story, you know, like five or six years ago when I was in training, I, I came across Dr. Fagenbaum um, through a mutual colleague and uh, got hooked on to Castleman's disease um, from knowing nothing to now I feel like I know a good amount about the disease and started um, through the help of the uh, Castleman's Collaborative Network, uh, getting patients and I'm seeing quite a few. And it's been, um, you know, as I say, although not the main focus of my job, it's now a reasonable amount. And it's been a, a great experience uh, helping taking care of a rare disease and very rewarding. And as amazing as everyone always says about David, how he's put this together and truly uh, championed this disease. And um, I'm happy to say that we're in the process of opening, hopefully we can get this through, of opening his clinical trial uh, uh, for patients with Castleman's disease where uh, uh, frontline therapy with IL-6 therapy doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely, Aaron. It's been, it's been so fun to work with you um, these last few years. And um, yeah, excited to keep working together more and keep um, trying to help as many patients as we can. So Maleva, any um, questions, um, burning questions in either the Q&A or the chat that you think we should touch on before we move to the next session? Yeah, and, and just so, um, for the, the whole um, community, we um, have reached out to Helen and, and obviously myself for doing the next sessions, and we feel fine bumping it about 10 minutes because I know we're running a little bit behind. So I will try to get to the questions that were asked just to make sure we do address them, and then we'll still give you guys that break and head on over. Um, so one of the questions that was asked um, for both of you are, do you recommend the third booster prior to the eight-month wait for people who are HHV8 positive multicenter Castleman disease? I mean, I, I would say that, yeah. yeah, we don't have an answer, right? I mean, I think I think Aaron and I are both seeing who's going to speak first because we don't have a good answer to this. But I do think that um, for HHV positive MCD, um, uh, particularly those patients that are on rituximab to treat their disease, you're likely going to be at a very increased risk of having a having a, a challenging course if you're infected with SARS-CoV-2. So. I would certainly be in the in be more in favor and in the camp of saying, you know, if there are things that you can do to lower that risk, I, I would do it. But Aaron, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, you know, so with HHV8, you know, fortunately now we do have rituximab, and you know, most people are treated with just with weekly times four or somewhat. They shouldn't. You shouldn't. Most people with this disease are not on a maintenance rituximab. Um, so again, it depends on the time period from your your rituximab. Um, if you're Fresh off, I would actually say wait a little bit to ensure uh, efficacy. Uh, but you're, if you're already, you know, half a year out, I would say just get it. And again, for the bone marrow transplant patients that I take care of, they're literally the highest risk from this disease. They have no immune system and it's recovering. I'm telling them to get it as soon as they can get it, uh, uh, unless they're on a, a profound amount of immunosuppression. And I think there's a chance that I'm going to get them off of it. If I know they're not going to get off of the immunosuppression, because of issues they're having, then I say still get it, accepting the fact that the vaccine might not be as effective, but I feel the risk to them is fairly system. I think this is a common misconception amongst my patients is they're scared that the vaccine will harm them because of their immune system. That's not the case. It's not gonna, it's not a virus. It's a piece of mRNA that codes for proteins. It's not gonna infect you or harm you if your immune system's lower. The only risk is that the vaccine just might not work as well, but it still will work in my opinion, even if it's a few percent, it's better than not getting it. Uh, so that's what I explain to my patients. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and kind of piggybacking off of that, that concept already. Um, the next question is if someone got the two dose vaccine two months before starting rituximab and their dosage currently with that treatment is once per week for four weeks, is it a problem or can they feel that they're still fully vaccinated being that they started so, so shortly after? From the lymphoma literature, we don't have Kapselman's literature. We have lymphoma literature. The patients after rituximab with B cell malignancies, um, do worse with COVID. Uh, we know that for sure, for sure, fairly confident. We don't know for sure if then revaccinating them is beneficial. To, uh, we don't. But that being said, I try to get my patients revaccinated, uh, um, and, and that's what I'm, I'm definitely doing that in the stem cell transplant setting. If they got vaccinated before the BMT, they're they're getting another. Uh, they're redoing their COVID vaccinations, and um, you know, I talk about with the patients what we just said: the unknowns and the knowns, and some agree to do it, and others don't. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think that um, you can certainly feel more confident that you made an antibody response if you got the vaccine before you started rituximab than if you got the vaccine while you were on rituximab. Um, but as Aaron said, it's certainly, uh, it's not going to be as good as if you didn't get um, a vaccine. And so uh, these are conversations to have with your doctor. And as we mentioned earlier, there are these monoclonal antibodies that Theoretically, you could talk to your doctors. If you're very worried, if you're high risk and you're worried about getting the virus, is you could actually get a prophylactic infusion of it, meaning that um, in addition to your vaccine, you could also actually get these antibodies. That way, um, you'd really be um, topped up and, and protected. Wonderful. Um, we'll probably take two or three more. Um, so another question is, would you say someone on siltuximab is less immunocompromised than someone on rituximab in this context? Yes. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Yeah, 100%. It's a, a for sure you're immunosuppressed on the rituximab. We actually don't know, right, David, with siltuximab, how much? Yep, we don't know. Yeah. Another question. Yeah, we know if you're on IL-6 blockade, we don't know if there's any negative effect on your vaccination ability. Unless if you're part of the vaccine response.org study, which Hopkins is doing, I, I'm in that study. And, and so if you're part of it, then you'll help us answer that question. Um, I did get my results back, and I found out that I made a really good antibody response despite being on serolimus and IVIG, although, as I mentioned earlier, I spread, spread those doses out. But if you are interested, join vaccinerespons.org, and they'll, they'll send you to a local lab to get a blood test, and you'll get the results back. Wonderful. Um, another question is... Um, it's directly concerning Castleman patients. So Castleman patients living in countries and states that are being mandated to take the vaccine um, and are there long-term effects that aren't being studied and do you support this mandate for Castleman patients? Should there be a concern there? All the this hard is, questions. Um, beyond Aaron and I figure it, I think. I think this is a bigger, this is a bigger, you know, bigger question, but Aaron, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. You know, I don't want to get political here. You know, I think when it comes to this, I think what we can all say is we all want people to, no one's wishing ill harm on anyone. I think, you know, we have different views when it comes to this. And I think that our intentions on both sides of this contentious issue are the same. We want people to be well, okay? Uh, um, that being said, so um, what I tell my patients is, yeah, do I know the long-term side effects of the COVID-19 vaccination? No, I know now almost a year of it, and it's a, uh, my scientific knowledge on an mRNA vaccine and all the vaccines we've done for sure is I'm not really worried at all, but I can't say I can tell you what's going to happen in 20 years. Uh, but that's with, you know, that's with a lot of stuff, including siltuximab, right? Like we only have uh, five, whatever year follow-up we have or a little bit longer. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, and now as far as, um, and, but I tell them it's the same with COVID. I mean, like you get COVID. Uh, you, we don't know what it's like 10 years from now after COVID-19. And there are definitely long-term side effects of COVID. I am fire, fairly confident the long-term side effects of COVID-19 infection are far more than the vaccination. And we know for sure that the vaccination prevents severe COVID. So uh, that, that's what I tell patients as far as long-term side effects. Now, as far as mandates, I'm not going to count on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I man think it's to individual uh, 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 states and employees now places like hospitals, you know, where we're taking care of immunosuppressed patients with bone, you know, um, I do think the, whether we force force, but strongly that people should be vaccinated in that situation due to the nature of what we do in our profession. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything that Aaron just said. And, um, yeah, it's hard for us to kind of, um, make uh, assessments based on like national and state level decisions. But I can tell you like, you know, in terms of 
uh, you know, the advice that Aaron and I are giving that this is exactly what I personally did, right? You know, I thought really long and hard about the short-term and long-term risks of getting the vaccine versus getting the virus. As I said, I think everyone would probably agree that the best option would be to live in a cave for the next three years and never get COVID. I mean, that's like your lowest risk option of anything, right? There's no long-term side effects of being in a cave maybe, or, you know, you're not going to die necessarily in the short term, but you live in a cave. Um, and so that's not really an option for most of us. And so if we want to live in, uh, you know, with other people that we love, then, then we're either going to get the virus or we're going to get the vaccine. There's no middle, there's no middle option, unfortunately. And so choosing to not get the vaccine is a, is a direct choice to get the virus. And so you have to be sure that you're, aware of what you're choosing and, and the risks associated with both. And we'll do one one final question and then um, we will wrap up this session. So the question is, um, I think somebody on Zoom today or yesterday did have some complications after, after vaccination, not super sick from it, but just significant after effects. Do you know the nature of these types of reactions and not set necessarily specific to Castleman patients, but just in general? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first thing I'd say, I think probably everyone on this call knows what I'm going to say, and that's please fill out the survey so that we get that information, whoever's feeling that. So the first thing is like, you know, we need that information. We don't have it unless unless it's shared through the survey. So whoever that was, please fill out the survey. And if you're not in Accelerate, join Accelerate so you can fill out the survey. But then to actually answer the question, um, absolutely, um, there are uh, short-term and also sounds like some lingering. You can hear about fatigue. Someone's tired for a week or so after their vaccine. Those, those things have clearly been reported, and um, and I think it's important to be aware of because again, you got to make this decision: to, how do I, you know, what's my risk of getting the virus versus what are my risks associated with the vaccine? Um, but uh, Aaron, I don't know if you have any any solid um, data or assessments on either your Castleman's patients that have reported certain things over others, or just generally. I had night sweats and I had a lymph node after the, the, the second dose. I had a low grade fever and I felt bad for 24 hours. I was actually thrilled about it. I was like, yeah, that's my T cells and B cells firing up and learning it. You know, what I explained to my patients and I, I prepare them for this. And I don't think we should hide. You know, um, I don't really call those though actually, you know, side effects and the fact that like, it's like you just can't talk or you can't walk afterwards like a Guillain-Barre syndrome. That's just how the vaccine works. It's, it's stimulating your immune response. And when your immune response is stimulated, whether it's abnormal stimulation, like in the setting of Castleman's, or whether it's appropriate from a, a vaccine or being exposed to an infection, uh, your immune system releases things that make you feel bad. So I just, I brace my patients for that. And um, I, I, you know, it's not, it definitely was, at least for vaccinations I've gotten, like I've never had any side effects from vaccines. And uh, from that one, I had the most arm pain I've ever had from a vaccine. And I got fevers and literally a lymph node from a vaccine. So. Uh, again, I think it's just education and setting expectations with this. Although I feel that those immediate side effects aren't, you know, I'm not worried about them long lasting or causing permanent damage. It's just temporary uncomfort of unpleasantness for a day or so after the vaccine. And, yeah, and the last thing I would say, and I'm, I'm sure Melba, we need to move to the next session, but the last thing I'd say is that um, we, as physicians, as scientists, we have to follow the data. And so we will continue to look at the data. This is not something that, that you know, we're gonna say, this is the way to go. Everyone should do this one thing and not follow. So we're gonna keep assessing it, following it. But again, we, it's hard to get our hands on the data unless, um, unless folks fill out the survey um, and, and join Accelerate and those sorts of things. So, um, so thanks to everyone who, who does complete that information so that way we can be on top of this. And we'll just share it with everyone. This is, this is for our, our community. And so if you contributed, if you've had a challenge, please fill out the survey so that way we can share it with, with the world. Absolutely. And, and just like at, in um, all of our sessions so far, if we did not get to your um, question, we are notating them. We will make sure to get all those answers out to you after summit's over. Um, we will post them in CDC and Connect and then also just send them out via email to everybody. Um, I do want to thank both Dr. David and Dr. Goodman for being here today. Um, Dr. Goodman, thank you for joining quite early on your end. Um, we very much value and appreciate both of your expertise. And I know that this is such a important and hot topic right now, being that you know the whole world is struggling with this through this pandemic and our patients um, just really are desperately looking for those answers. So it's been really great to have you both here and both sharing your knowledge um, and and I really appreciate both of you. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks for having me. So 
Um, for all of our patients on the other side of the webinar, um, this is a time where you're going to take your break. I have alerted Helen that we ran a little bit behind. So take the break that you guys need and then hop on over to either the patient link or the loved one link. They're going to be thrown into the chat real quick. It was also sent out in your email this morning. Um, and again, these are a little bit less formal. So it's on Zoom. All of your cameras will be on. You guys will be able to see each other. Um, we will obviously dive in and have some um in-depth conversation for a little bit, but then it's really just a little bit more of open sharing. So take your break and then head on over to the next Zoom link. I really appreciate all of you guys. See you soon.